Hello and welcome to Something to Think About with the British Bible School. My name is Mark Hill and it was my privilege a number of years ago to be a student of the British Bible School when it was residential. And now as things have changed and it's moved online, I'm glad to be part of a group that's able to bring you these messages and be involved in other ways of teaching the Bible to anyone who's willing to listen. So thank you for being willing to listen again. And if you do like these messages, please do subscribe to our channel so that you can be notified of when other talks are being presented and maybe let other people know about it as well. As I consider this something to think about message, we're coming to the close of another year. Now, I'm being quite cunning here. I'm not going to mention what year we're coming to the close of, because that will date this, and then it won't be able to be used over and over again. Maybe you wouldn't want to listen to it over and over again after hearing it once. But if we live long enough, we will yet again come to a close of yet another year and we'll look forward again to a new year with everything that we hope that brings. Now, for some, it's a time to reflect, to have happy memories of some things that have taken place in the preceding year, and then to look forward to even more good times. For others, it's a relief to get to the end of a bad year, to say goodbye to it, and to move on into a new year with hopes of things being better. For others, they've had a bad year and can't see any hope for the future. And there's no prospects of anything good happening again. This time of year brings about so many different thoughts for so many different people. Some are of joy, some, sadly, are quite depressing, are quite upsetting. So what is it for you? For me personally, I know that without faith in God, it's just another day. I mean, what is the difference really? What is the significance? What's different about the 31st of December to January the 1st, when you woke, wake up on a new day? Why is that less significant than going to bed on June the 30th and waking up on the 1st of July? What hopes and dreams do you plan for over those two particular months and everything that might go with them? I mean, admittedly, in the summer, we have longer days, we have sunshine, we have brighter times. There's the opportunity to be outdoors. I myself like to do a little bit of vegetable gardening. Once we hit the winter and the dark nights are in, that's a little bit of therapy that is no longer available. So we hit these dark nights, these short days, and we want something to look forward to. But really, it is just another night and another day. We place so much in store for things getting better just because midnight passes and a new day begins. But why on that particular day? What is the significance of the 31st of December? In fact, what's the significance of something that happened six days before that as well? You see, in these dark nights, we do want something to look forward to. We want something to be able to enjoy. And maybe this is why people in this run up to the end of the year start looking forward to it earlier and earlier and earlier. Is there really a difference before and after? As one year closes, that was the before. Is it giving us a brighter and better? after. Personally myself over this past year I've tried to uh, do something about my uh, weight and, and, and not put it on I mean by that. With lockdown and everything that went with it I really got to a, a weight that I'd never been before and started to feel quite unwell because of it and being out with the, the, the children although two of them are practically adults now to try and keep up with them, especially the, the youngest one, was just more and more painful. And, and, and I need to sit down and get my breath and have a rest. And that's no way to be. And already with what's been done, 
with the help that I've received through the club that I attend, it's a before that was awful and an after that is much improved and where I feel much better and where I've got more energy and sleep better. Incredible, the things that we can do that can take us from one particular state into another state that's better. So there is, for me, a before and after where that is concerned. You know, there's other before and afters as well. People who enjoy fixing up cars that have perhaps been neglected. You see pictures before where it's rusty and there's a wheel missing or whatever it might be, no windscreen. Then restoration work takes place and you see the different picture before and after and it's like a new car. We all like the idea of a before and after, whatever it might be. We like that difference. Now for me and many others, perhaps yourself if you're watching, can you remember life before Jesus? What was your life like before you knew about Jesus, before you'd come under the sound of his teaching, before you responded to the words from the Bible that were taught? Was there a definite before that is different to the after meeting Jesus? I grew up in the church. I was raised by parents who were following Jesus already. There was very little difference, or so I thought, to me, in actually deciding to put on Christ in baptism. Yet even then, there was very definitely a before and after. There is a, more of an awareness, an alertness to, to not do those things that I really hadn't taught to do and to strive after those things that I wanted to do, but also a feeling of security that I didn't have before, the security of knowing that I'm safe with Jesus, that I'm doing the right thing. What was your before? What was your before Christ and your after Christ? In fact, considering your own life before Christ and the way it's changed afterwards, do you ever wonder, do you ever think about what the world was like before Christ had been, before Christ was known, before he walked the earth and did the things that he did? What was that life, what was that world like before when there was no Jesus to speak about? There was, amongst those who followed God, something to look forward to, but what exactly was that something that they were looking forward to? I mean, people today are trying to do away with Jesus, aren't they? They don't, don't want him to be around. They don't want to submit their lives to this particular character. Who wants to be told what to do by anyone? Yet Jesus has made a difference to this world to the extent that he cannot possibly be ignored. People will try to ignore him. People will try to not have him as part of their life at all. But is it really possible? What was the world like before he came? What would the world be like now if Jesus hadn't been? In fact, his arrival was so momentous that we count our years from the time he came to earth. Isn't that incredible? That we actually count the number of years that have happened since Jesus walked on this earth. How did people count before that? We, we, we see great events in history, in our history, and we give it a number of a date that stems from the time when Jesus was on the earth. Now, people didn't know when Jesus was going to come. So they didn't say that this invasion by Babylon was in such and such a year. A year from what? They couldn't say. I mean, we look back now and we say how many years before Christ these things happened. But what did they do then? What were they counting from? How did they record 
that that event took place and when it took place. It might have been in the year of a particular king, a year of his reign. It might have happened during the year of someone's particular lifespan. But how else was history recorded? We can do it now, counting back. But how was it done then? So Jesus' arrival was so momentous that we count back the years from it to particular years in history before his arrival, and we assign a number of years from the time that Christ was on earth for our own history today. Isn't it ridiculous that some people are trying to write Jesus out of history by calling before the time he came, before the common era? Well, there was a before the common era, which means there is a common era that has come after it. But it seems to me there was something in the middle. There was a before and after. So we have before the common era, then something, who knows what, happened, and we have the common era. Do these folks not realise that that event was that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was born to a virgin woman and changed the world forever? As much as people try to do away with Jesus, it just can, can't happen. So when we give a date, we are dating from something. Many people have attempted to assign an age to the earth and they've numbered it in billions of years. Billions of years in which things have taken place so slowly and now suddenly have speeded up. And yet, can it really be that accurate? People try to date things from the strata of the earth and there's problems with that. There's a lot of guesswork with all of these things. Indeed, people have tried to date the age of the earth by looking at the, the ancestry of people in there and the number of years that they lived. But we can't even say without a shadow of doubt that these things are accurate because we don't know that all people in that lineage, that ancestry, was actually included. So we might be out by a few years, whereas others will be out by billions or millions of years. What do we listen to? Well, I would suggest that we actually take in stock the fact that a momentous event happened in history from which we look back and from which we look forward. What was that event? Well, I want to read from Luke chapter 2 in the Bible. Luke chapter 2. And this is talking about a historical event that took place. And if we can accept that historical event, then the event that took within it, we can also really, really trust. At that time, the Roman Emperor, Augustus, okay, we can find out about that. We can know whether or not there really was a Roman Emperor called Augustus. So at that time, the Roman Emperor, Augustus, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. Was there a Roman Empire? I think we could look into it and research and find out that, yes, there was a Roman Empire, and one of the Caesars, one of the emperors, was Augustus. This was the first census, Luke continues to say, taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria, another name, another place. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, they had to go to Bethlehem in Judea. More historical characters, more actual places that we can find. David's ancient home was Judea. He travelled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee, another real place. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. All these real places 
all these real characters in history, why would we suddenly stop and say, well, these folks don't really exist? It would be foolish. And while they were there, Bethlehem that is, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Isn't that interesting? Do you want to know why we number our years or what from? It's that event. This child that was born when real things in history that we can check up on were happening in real places in geography we can check up on were. Why would we suddenly turn around and say these events and these people aren't real? It's just a fairy tale. Ridiculous. We even have counted our years to that particular event. Now the thing about the before and after is that there was a world without Christ and now there is a world with Christ. And for each one of us, we're called to leave our own little world without Christ and to live a life with Christ. In Galatians, the Apostle Paul, whose conversion was also a momentous event, was something that people will look to and say, it is so incredible what we know about this particular character that he should change in the way that he has. And this man changed completely from a time before Christ was in his life to a time after Christ was in his life. And we can trust what he has to say about the Messiah. And he writes to the churches in Galatia and says in Galatians 4 and verse 8, Before you Gentiles knew God, and Gentiles, of course, for anyone who isn't a Jew, before you Gentiles knew God, you were slaves to so-called gods that do not even exist. So now that you know God, or should I say, now that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of the world? You are trying to earn favour with God by observing certain days or months or seasons or years. I fear for you. Perhaps all my hard work with you was for nothing. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to live as I do in freedom from these things, for I have become like you Gentiles, free from those laws. I want to venture to suggest that our observance of a new year, and certainly this was the case for me in my life, our observance of that time was as though it was something magical, that things would magically change. The clock would strike 12, we would move on, some magic would happen about that day. In a way that uh, any other day passes from one to the next and nothing magical happens. What are you holding on to? What is it that you are hoping for? Let me ask you to examine the evidence. Why do we date the way we do? I don't mean men and women dating each other. I mean the date of the year. How many years have passed since Christ arrived? That is the momentous event that took place that caused us to date our years and count our years in the way that we do. Call it before the common era if you want. But something happened that then brought about the common era. What was it? Of course, it was the birth of Jesus Christ. We might be out by a few years, but something happened that was so momentous, we count back from that time and we count forward to now. Now, what about you? What does this mean to you that Jesus actually came? Do you want a before and after? And we can have it. Even I, as someone who's been following Jesus for some time, I can stop and take check of myself and start again. 
Because Jesus, even though I accepted him when I was baptized, even though I put to death my old life and had that before put away so that I could live a better after, I failed every now and again. And I've needed to rein myself in and start again. And you have that option. You have that option, not by magic, not by a particular date in the year, not by suddenly, for some reason, midnight's passed and everything's going to be fine. But because the reality is, Jesus was born on this earth to give his life as a ransom for us so that we can put to death our old life and lead a new life in him. We'd love to give you more information if you need it. If you know what to do and you haven't done it, Please do so. Give your life to Jesus Christ. That's the only way to have a proper before and after.